Hi, it's Jen from Shabby Fabrics. We recently introduced Chilling with My Snowmies, this adorable, adorable snowman block of the month quilt designed by Deb Grogan. Customers are loving this, signing up like crazy flannel, lovely and cozy, warm, prefused laser cut applique, which we know you all love. And when we introduced this, I promised you some supporting videos to show you how do we put these pieces together to pre-assemble them. So we're moving them onto the background as one piece. And then what's this business about hand embroidery? So I'm actually filming that right now and letting you see this early so that if you have always wanted to do a block of the month and you're like, I don't know anything about the process or even if I can even do this. I want to show you how fun and easy it is. This, yes, if you're a beginner, don't think this is past you, not even close. Definitely something you're capable of doing. So if you're just seeing this for the first time, this is Chilling With My Snow Me's a block of the month. It's exactly what we're saying. You get a section of the quilt for a period of time. And then in the end, you put them all together. You add your inner borders, your sashing, outer borders, and you have a beautiful quilt to display. So on many of the months, you're getting more than one section. We have a nice tight program here, so it's not being dragged out over too long of a period of time. So what you can expect each month, of course, is in your first shipment, you'll be getting your pattern as well as some additional diagrams. These layout diagrams are absolutely gold, and I'm going to show you how to use those. Make sure you keep those handy. I know what that's like. Uh, a lot of times that I've been a part of the block of the month, I couldn't stay on course. I couldn't stay on time, on schedule, I guess I'd call it. I fell behind. But the most important thing is when I did find time, I had all of my fabric and all of my diagrams and patterns, and I was ready to go. So if you don't keep up, I understand that. I don't think I've ever kept up with any block of the month I've been a part of. Just busy life, kids, all of those things. But make sure these diagrams, these supplemental diagrams, you're keeping them with your fabric. This is the essence of helping you be successful. So let's just look at that. When you get your shipments, most of the time, because the blocks are big, they will be on at least two pages. And then with the birdhouse block here, that one's even on three pages. So let's just look at our diagrams. We have some lineup bullseyes for you just to help get that ever so nicely lined up. If you've got a light box, hey, use, the, use that resource. It makes it even that much easier to just know that you're absolutely perfectly lined up where you want to be. And once you find that sweet spot, now just go ahead and tape your diagram together. Sometimes I like to actually do that on the back as well. Otherwise, you kind of get this flap back here that is kind of just flopping around, might get in your way a little bit later on when we start to use the diagram. If you are inclined to trim away the excess. Out here, maybe you have a dull rotary blade, a dull pair of scissors. Don't use your best scissors to do that. We all know that our best scissors can get really dull cutting paper. So I will just go ahead and meet, leave mine like this, not a problem. Let's look at our diagram. I'll turn the light off here so it's not so bright from the overhead. Our shapes are numbered, and that's to help you know what piece is gonna go down first, because of course there is an arrangement, right? That pom-pom, of course, goes on top of the hat. So let's just look at our diagram and we'll find our very first piece. Our arm is our piece number one. So that one would be coming down first, followed by our star. You get the idea that this is helping you understand the arrangement here because the star can't be behind the hand. The pom-pom can't be behind the hat. So that's just letting you know piece one goes down first, piece two, so on and so forth. Dash lines let you know that that part of that uh, shape is lying behind another. So this very tip of his arm is lying behind the star and the very tip of his hat is lying right behind the pom-pom. Again, just helping you understand that kind of three dimension, that layering. So I find those things very helpful. The dash lines here, those are for embroidery. We'll be talking about that in just a bit. When you get your shapes, prefuse laser cut, there's fusible webbing on the back. The easiest way to release that fusible webbing is to just give a good crease, just like that. Don't be shy. And it'll help release the paper. If it doesn't release, give it a good press again. 
And we have obviously a very good uh, bond with, with this flannel. Sometimes when I uh, give a good, there we go. Yeah, we want a good contact, right? We want to make sure that our shapes have full heat and bond. I've done that before when I, back in the day, when I used to, back in the day, <laughs> when I used to trace um, this onto heat and bond myself, iron this to the background. Sometimes I wouldn't get a complete bond and part of it would still be kind of sticking to my uh, heat and bond, but not completely transferred. That's the best part about this. This is professionally uh, on a heat press, so everything is fully bonded. So let's just put our shapes together. Now, you can see that this is out here, so I could do that as a single unit. I'm gonna turn my light box on. My iron is at a medium heat. As quilters, we are so used to having that iron on a full hot, but really any fusible webbing product does not tolerate that full cotton or linen setting well at all. And the medium setting is what's recommended. So we'll use the, this is the wafer two light box. This is the larger Applifuse mat. This is the magic combination. Light box, layout diagram, and we're gonna have our wool pressing mat nearby because we cannot iron on our light box. If I could have a dream come true, that would be my dream. But so far that dream has not come true because this cannot accept heat. We do have to do a transfer. And you can see that my pressing surface is actually kind of smaller than this. So I'm gonna actually do this as a section and add that a little bit later on. I'll show you what I'm talking about here. Now there's also two different sizes of Applifuse mats. I recommend you get them both because for this section, it's exceptionally big, but for the overall project, it's the right size. So sometimes I use both sizes of the Applifuse mats on the same project. So the first shape's gonna go down and I can see it clearly through my light box and you can probably see that from the overhead camera. The Applifuse mats are tacky. There's a stickiness to this. Some applique sheets, I'll call them, are very slippery. The, the slightest bump and your pieces are moving. I've used those. This is one of the reasons I use this exclusively now for any fusible that I'm doing. Any fusible app, this is my go-to. I love that I can pick this up. This isn't going anywhere. I want as many things working toward the common goal and that's that shapes stay where I put them down. Now let's look at this one. Again, we're going to find our orientation. We just kind of keep turning it until we think we found it. Let's see, where is that shape, right? Nope, not there. Oh, yep, there it is. Now there's very little contact right there. And I could iron that down, but I'm gonna kind of just keep moving because my Applifuse mat is big enough to do that. Now, one thing that I've noticed is when I'm doing this, sometimes because uh, it's of uh, just the nature of this mat, it can be hard to see the diagram. If that's you, you might want to take a photo of this layout and you're kind of just referencing that so you know what your next pieces are. That's just something I've kind of discovered over the years as I, at times, was struggling to to see through the Applifuse mat. I wanted to use the Applifuse mat, but I was struggling to see the numbers from behind. Now I can see this arrangement. Now let's talk about our next pieces. And I'm definitely going to be briefing you about that uh, embroidery that's coming up. So that's piece three. So right now, right, I'm having to kind of take a peek. Four and five. So let's just take a peek, see how we're doing. And I can see number seven is next. I'll tell you what I'm gonna do. Let me leave this off to the side. Let's talk about seven. Seven is that face. Notice how we have, of course, our snowman smile. You get an option now. 
If I take P7 right now to my diagram, even without the light box, I can see it. But when I turn the light box on, look how I can see the smile. All right. You have an option. If you're like me, you're like, I don't want to have to freehand that later. And you want to know exactly where that stitching goes. You can use a micron pen and draw that on now. Here's what that will mean. When we go to do our stitching, you need to hit those lines exactly as drawn because they won't iron away. So this is where I want to give you an option. If you are not confident in your hand embroidery and you want to wait and draw on this style, uh, the smile freestyle, which is what Tammy did, you can wait and just look at the picture and kind of just do those dra uh, dash lines later or do them now. Since Tammy did that freestyle, freehand, I'm just going to go the other direction so you see both options. So what that would mean is I'm not going to grab for my friction pen. The reason being is when we iron this all to the background, which we will, all of the lines you draw with a friction pen disappear. That's why we love our friction pen. If we make any mistakes or not to make any uh, redraw a line, you can just iron it away and start over with nothing left behind. The micron pen, not, not so. This is permanent. So I'm going to be very intentional, intentional, I should say, about drawing where I'm going to stitch. Okay, we have that there. Now, while I'm here, I might as well mark where those eyes are going to go. Because again, I don't want to guess. All we need to do is put a little bit of an indicator here. Because that will come later on. That is actually going to come after my quilt is already even quilted. So it's nice to have that target right there right now for later on. Now there's some embroidery off to the side that kind of wraps around his arm. There is nothing you can do with a permanent marker and the light box to mark that now. We've brought our dark navy fabric here to the background and no matter how light bright that light box is, you can't see it. Even in a dim room, maybe even with the lights turned off, you might ever so slightly see it but it's not reliable. So that one we will go where we're kind of, I'll, well, I'll take you there when we're ready to get to that stage. So I wanted to, before I just put that piece down, give you that option to, you could decide on what you wanna do. So I will bring this back. Now that we took that option of a permanent marker with our micron, make sure nothing got bumped here. And this will go down next. Followed by his hat. Hmm, let's see where this goes. Ah, yes, of course it goes here. I don't have a picture in front of me. That that alone is, a, you know, just a visual reference. Where does this go? Of course, we have his nose. Looks like we've got one more piece. Sometimes, oh, I can see just the tip of that star. I'm just going to take a peek. What I will do is understand the orientation of where, what that orient, okay, not like that, that. Okay, keep that in mind. We'll move it back over.
I can see that. Let's see how much of that reaches onto his face. Sometimes you're just kind of like, okay, I'm looking at the picture. I can see it's just a little bit on his face. Once you're happy, now we very carefully move this to the mat and we begin to press down. Make sure I'm happy with that. Yep. Medium heat, you'll hold each section about five to six seconds. So I'll get that all ironed down. I'm gonna let it cool. When I come back, we're gonna take this off. It'll be merged together as one unit and then we'll move on to our hand embroidery. So our snowman has cooled down. And this is my favorite. It's like a magic trick. <laughs> I love showing off what this Aplifuse mat is capable of doing over and over again. It's incredible. It never leaves residue, even when I'm working with wool. Absolutely incredible. So if you've heard me say, instead of moving pieces, you know, onto the background one by one, this is the way to do it. And it is. And you just roll it up. I highly recommend you do that. You don't want any dust on this. These are the slap and wrap heels by the Gypsy Quilter. We use them for stabilizer, the Aflafuse mat. Keeps everything nice and organized in your sewing room. You might want to pick those up if you struggle you know, with things unrolling on you. So now that we have that, we would have cut our background out to the exact size shown. Of course, the dash line is showing the seam allowance. We'll lay this down, turn this on. Pretty difficult to see if I had this on the full bright and the lights in the room were off. If I can even see a part of it, but let's say you can't. It's still helpful to have the diagram back there because I start to take some peaks. Now let's look at something. Notice the bottom of the snowman's body is sewn into the seam allowance. It is not meeting at the sashing, it's in the seam allowance. So that's a great first clue. You already know the bottom of the snowman is here. The question is laterally where? So you can use some clues like that. Now I can also be just above the bottom and see how I have a dashed line right here to say I'm way, way off course here. So let's scoot that down. Really, if you get the bottom square, since the rest of this was already assembled, it kind of can't be anywhere else. There's a little bit of flexibility, so let's just take a peek. And if yours is incrementally left or right, it doesn't matter, right? Still absolutely adorable. Now, once it's exactly where we want it to be, Again, we will take that carefully and iron down for our six seconds. While I'm ironing that down, we'll get ready for some hand embroidery. Basically, all of your applique is done the same way. Same process throughout the whole time. And how fun is that? You skipped all the tracing, skipped all the cutting. Everything's perfectly cut and you can just enjoy the fun part. Once that's done, you can stitch that down. In fact, I'm glad I'm saying this out loud. I would stitch it right now with the applique thread set. The reason being is once you start making contact with this, with hand embroidery, keep in mind fusible is not meant forever. It's just meant to hold it in place while you are doing your machine uh, applique. So I've done that before where I got really excited to do the embroidery and hadn't stitched this down and it started to lift just because of my contact with the project. So this is where that thread set comes in. So if you didn't pick that up when you signed up for the program and maybe you forgot, grab that right now, um, super affordable. And then you have, those are the exact colors we use. That's sulky 50 weight, or maybe if you've got something at home, a 50 weight, 40 or 60, any of those would work well. So I'll keep ironing that down. Of course we would do our machine applique 
And we'll just look at what we did so you get an idea. Generally, when we do our machine applique, we generally just sew just inside that line with the coordinating thread. If you want to get fancy, do a blanket stitch or a decorative stitch, by all means, let your personality come out. We just generally do a straight stitch just inside the edge with a coordinating thread. So we'll assume that was done, and now we're ready to move on to the hand embroidery. So you can see because we went ahead and uh, pre-marked it, we don't have to guess where this hand embroidery is going to be. Now over here, that's a different story. So once again, I really find it helpful to, while I can't see through this dark flannel to see the background, I can take a peek and begin to freehand where the lines will be, where we'll be doing the same stitch, uh, but this time over on the background with the cream thread. So let's just do that right now. And I'm just kind of looking. This is a sew line. If you have a white marking pen or tool you like, grab that. If not, this is a great option for you. Um, it's not forever, which I like. It's on there for just a bit. So sometimes I'm like, okay, where am I ultimately going to go? Over here by, uh, you could measure. I use whatever clues I can find. Now, I've only, the reason I've got this out here is when we cut our sashing, it's great to have that two and a half. It's great for binding as well. But sometimes I want, if I want to be very precise, I'm going to say, okay, that is two and five eighths off of, you see what I'm saying? You can get very specific and say, all right, I'm going to have, I'm going to come in at this or, and then kind of fish around, or you can just freestyle. You can just draw whatever you want. You can be as specific or casual as you want to be. I would recommend pre-marking I've done before where I just like, I'm just going to go for it. It didn't go so well. <laughs> I ended up a seam ripping because I wasn't very happy with what I was seeing. But you get the idea that you can just be kind of trying to mimic this. See that spot right there? I would mark it now so I know what I'm shooting for. See that? Same here. It's like, okay, right down through this. See, so now we kind of have our trail. That's all we need to get going. I have my Richard Hemming size four needles. We use two strands of embroidery floss. We have a black and an off-white uh, right here. I'll just show you on here. It's probably a little easier for you to see. Two strands. I've threaded a needle. This, if you've not done a lot of embroidery, this is a uh, DMC embroidery floss. There are six strands as you pull this out. Well, here's one for you. There's six total. So when you want to pull a strand out, I recommend you pull out one at a time. I'd already pulled out two of those. And try to smooth it out so that it's ready to go again for your next embroidery. And then you'll bring the two ends up, thread your needle. If you have any trouble with that, Clubber makes a great needle threader. I definitely use it. Um and then not on the end. This is a really fun, it's called a running stitch. So we'll come up and this is easy, right? We're just trying to cover the line we, we drew. That's all we're trying to do. You can also go just a little bit before and a little bit past your line to make sure you have it. No harm with that. And then you'll come up and go back down. Easy, easy, easy. Some people will come down rock and come up at their next place makes it even a little bit quicker i wanted to show you that option as well a 
really fun and it goes very quickly. You can see I'm traveling pretty quick. If you want to come back to here, you can, but I would recommend kind of fishing through where you've already been shallow so you don't just take some big jump. It's always safest to just tie off, but you can travel back and start again. I'll just start stitching down in this direction. You can see my contact with the project, which is why stitching that down with your applique thread first is definitely the route to go, definitely what you wanna do. See how I'm just kind of rocking that needle? This goes very, very quick. And you just keep going. Easy, easy, easy. A great project for a beginner. You can see the idea. Once you're all done, we will just, you've got a lot of fabric back here, plus the fusible, plus the layer above. See, I'm very shallow. I'm not coming to the front. I'm just kind of creating a place to create a loop. Always tie off twice. Make sure that knot is right against your fabric. And you can leave a longer tail. No one is able to see that from the front. Sometimes when you have a light colored, uh, you don't have as many layers, you can see that tail trailing behind. With these darker fabrics, that will not be an issue. That's it for the hand embroidery. Let me just look around. I don't think there's any other stitches, really just sewing on buttons. Actually, you know what? There's a, fr there's a French knot here. Let's talk about French knots. Let's just pretend these are French knots. We know they're buttons. Same thing, two strands, tie a knot. Let's cover those French knots. I don't want to leave any mysteries here. A very old classic stitch. You will come up. We're gonna pretend this is our bird's eye. If this was the snowman as it is, of course, you're just gonna sew on a button. You've got the button has the two holes. You just come up, go down, come up, come down a couple times, tie off, go do the next eye. But let's pretend this is the bird's eye. Come up, off to the side, needle in front. We're going to wrap around once, wrap around twice. Pivot downward and go in. Hold tension on the thread off to the side as long as you can and then release. If you're like, that's really small. I, I really want to have a bigger eye. Okay. Come up. Let's do it again. Thread to the side. By the way, you could add more strands of thread embroidery floss. Maybe you want four. That would work. Or more wraps. Either way, bulks out. Helps build bulk. Let's say we want to wrap four times. I would always get more embroidery floss. It's easier to keep control of that and still do two wraps than to now just keep wrapping. But let's take this approach since we have it threaded. One, two, three, four. And down. And let's see if that produces the eye, the bulk, the size of knot we're looking for. So I want you to be able to see that. So you can see that it's bolder. So that is probably maybe a look you prefer. And again, just tie off in the back. So you can see here, um, so cool, really easy embroidery for a beginner. Now get all your blocks done. Then will come that sashing that we talked about. Uh, which is this cute hound's tooth. Of course, we've got that in our inner border and our outer border. Notice how the outer border, we've given you some extra fabric. Plaids are tough, right? Plaids can want to drift off during the printing process. So when you get your uh, finishing kit, notice how we were very intentional about trying to stay tracking parallel to one of those lines of the plaid. So don't just willy-nilly cut your, your borders. Be intentional. Use your ruler 
pick your line. Don't don't necessarily worry about the the mat, but get your plaid. Find your favorite line. Maybe it's this one. Maybe it's the dark blue. Flossy cut that. Get that edge going straight. And then from that point, measure over the width of your borders. That's how you get borders looking nice and straight and not wonky. You've all seen quilts like that. Uh, It drives me crazy, to be honest with you. It's very distracting, especially when someone's done so much work on the interior of the quilt, and then the borders were just kind of almost disregarded. So I want to call that, that's not by accident that our borders are like that. That was very intentional, and you will have enough fabric in your kit to do that as well. So you can see this is totally doable. There is limited space. In fact, by the time you're maybe watching this, I don't even know if there will be space left. But if you're just now kind of watching and you're like, I want to be a part of this, be sure to click on the link. We'll have that in the video. You can see if kits are still available or maybe a friend sees you working on your blocks. Let them know and hopefully there'll be a spot for them as well. Be sure to subscribe to our channel. Hit that bell. That way, as new videos come out, you automatically know and you're not going to miss out on any future projects. Thank you for letting me show you more about how to put together these blocks, and you can see how fun and easy it is to be a part of the Block of the Month program. I'll see you soon on a future Shabby video.